Good morning. I'd like to begin by wishing everybody a happy Resurrection Day. I don't know if you realize it or not, but the very reason we meet on Sundays as opposed to Saturday is because Sunday was the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Prior to that, they met on Saturdays. But after the resurrection, the day Jesus conquered death, the day he came out of that empty garden tomb was a Sunday morning. And that's why we gather today on Sundays is to commemorate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our text this morning is going to come from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, much, much of this chapter, chapter is all about the resurrection of Jesus and the theological implications and what it uh, means for us today. And we're going to kind of move around in the chapter, but I'm going to begin by reading 1 Corinthians 15 verses 20 through 26. 20 through 26. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Fallen asleep is a metaphor for death. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own turn. Christ, the first fruits, then, when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has made all his enemies, put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Now let's drop down to verse 51, and I'll read through verse 56. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. The story is told of three men who were suddenly killed and they find themselves before St. Peter and the pearly gates and um, Peter says to these three fellows, he said, you know, if you, if you could go back to earth, if you could go back to your funeral visitation, what would you like to hear them say about you? One of the guys said, well, if I could go back to my funeral visitation, I would like to hear someone talk about... Uh, how good of a husband I was and how, how good a father I was. The other guy spoke up and said, if I could go back to my visitation, I would like to hear someone speak up and talk about how hard a worker I was in the church. Third guy speaks up and said, if I could go back to my funeral visitation, I would like to hear someone say, look, he moved. <laughs> Jesus Christ came into this world to destroy death. He came into this world to even destroy the fear of death. And he did this through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, which validated what he had done for mankind on the cross. In short, Jesus' victory over death guarantees our victory over death. His resurrection from the dead guarantees our resurrection from the dead. In this passage I just shared with you, we find Three, what I'm going to call three resurrection comparisons. They're very powerful. It's important that we understand what Paul's telling us when it pertains to the resurrection of Jesus. First comparison he mentions is, I'm going to call this the Jesus slash first fruits comparison. First fruits Sometimes you hear that, that term in churches, and usually it's associated with some kind of offering that they're taking up. Well, the first fruits technically was an Old Testament term. It was a, a term 
used in reference to what the Old Testament Jews offered to God in the temple. Let's say you're living in the Old Testament era and you've planted some wheat and you've watched that wheat grow all summer and then it's time to harvest it and you go out to the wheat field and you put the sickle to it and you take that very first bundle of wheat and you take that very first bundle to the temple and you offer it to God. He's getting the very first part right off the top very first part that comes out of that field. That's a first fruit offering. Okay, Paul is saying here in the text that Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. This is loaded with meaning. Several ideas are associated with this idea of Jesus being the first fruit. He's saying he's like that first bundle of wheat that's taken out and placed at the temple. What's he getting at? Well, for one, the first fruits offering was the first part of a greater harvest to come. That first little part that was taken out represented there's more to come. Jesus was the first part of a greater resurrection to come. It is just a matter of time and there's going to be more bodies harvested. Or what we might say, more bodies resurrected. This will include all faithful Christians who have died. In those faithful saints of the Old Testament era who have passed away, there's going to be a great harvest. There's going to be a lot of folks that are Christ followers and have been faithful to God throughout the ages. They're going to rise from the dead. So Jesus was the first part of a greater harvest to come. First fruits indicated also that the same kind of crop was going to be harvested. Again, if, if wheat was brought out of the field, that meant there's more wheat to come. If uh, more figs were picked and taken to the temple, that meant there's more figs to come. If more grapes were picked and that first part was offered as a first fruit offering, it meant more grapes were to come. More of the same kind of thing. So if Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection, we're going to have a body like his risen glorified body. The same kind of fruit is coming. Jesus is just the first part of it. Listen to what Paul writes in Philippians 3.21. The Lord, speaking of the Lord, He will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. This first fruits analogy teaches us that we're going to receive a resurrected body like Jesus' resurrected body. He was the first part of more to come like Him. I'll give you all some homework. How would you all like some homework? Here's your homework. Go back through the, the gospel accounts, and I want you to take note of what all Jesus was able to do with his resurrected body. And keep in mind that Paul is saying we're going to get a body like his body. His resurrected body, there's going to be more to come like him. Also, the first fruits analogy teaches us uh, that, that the resurrection was a token uh, the first fruit offering was a, really a, was a token offering, and it, it represented that they realized that really everything they had belonged to God. They were just giving back a small part and saying, God, we're giving you this, but we recognize all of it really belongs to you. In a similar way, uh, when we're resurrected, uh, it's going to be a sign that we belong to God. The question this morning is, have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Do you belong to God? Have you placed yourself under God's authority? Have you been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus? Does he own you lock, stock, and barrel? You see, when you belong to God, that guarantees that you're coming with this resurrection that Jesus was just a first fruit of. This brings us to the second comparison. The second one is the Jesus slash Adam comparison. These two characters... Stand at opposite ends of the spiritual spectrum. One human being brought death into the world. The other human being, slash God, brought life into the world. Remember when God placed Adam in the garden? You can eat of any tree in the garden except that one. That one tree, this, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what does Adam, our forefather, do? He disobeys God, and he eats the forbidden fruit. Yes, it was Eve who gave it to him. And yes, 
she was tempted by the devil. But did you notice in our text who God seems to really hold responsible for that? It says, in Adam. Eve suffers the consequences, there's no doubt about that. We'll talk more about that in just, just a few moments. But, but notice in our text that Paul says, Adam, Adam is the one who introduced death into this world, not Eve. Isn't that interesting? You know, we can't just blame it on that woman, can we? She is not credited with introducing death into this world. Who knows, if Adam had not sinned, maybe God would have made him a different model. After all, he had plenty more ribs, right? Seriously, as a kind of footnote, we can see that God holds the man responsible for how he heads his household. God's Word says the man is the head of the family. We see that in 1 Corinthians 11, 3, Ephesians 5, 23. God is saying, you know, that the man is, is, is the head. He's in charge. But with that authority comes great responsibility. God holds the man responsible for how he leads or does not lead his family. Men, what kind of spiritual leaders are you in the home? Are you watching over your family and making sure that um, they're headed in a godly direction? Are you setting the tone with a godly example? Do they see you making godly decisions? Are you instilling God's values in the family? Do they see you making church and the kingdom of God a priority? Fellows, make no mistake about it. God will hold us accountable for how we lead our families. Like it or not, you demand. That's what God's Word says. As you know, Adam initially set a terrible example and introduced death into this world and decay and all the rotten stuff that goes along with the fall. And when we see these things in our world today and we get frustrated, we can point all the way back to Adam. He is the one. He is the one that introduced all this frustration, all this decay, all this death into the world. And Paul tells us in our passage that everyone who is not a Christian is somehow corporately in Adam. So he sets up this, this dichotomy. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. One or the other. And he says if you're, if you're in Adam, you're in a state of death and you are without hope. But you don't have to stay in Adam. You can get into Jesus. This is where he comes in. He came to this earth to undo the curse that Adam set in motion. Jesus came to remove the curse of sin and death. And you can look around and see that this earth is still in a state of decay and sin and death. I don't have to look any further than in my kitchen usually. I usually can find a piece of fruit reminding me that, that death and decay is still with me. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's a banana on my counter right now that's almost black. There's some tomatoes that are getting mushy. A few weeks ago, I'll never forget this, we had a big cucumber on the counter, and that thing got really soft, and the next thing I knew, there was this stinky liquid all over the counter where that thing had just rotted and collapsed. It looked good on the outside, but it just... And man, it was, it was a mess to clean up. Wendy was gone on spring break. She didn't know about that till just now. <laughs> But it's a reminder that, 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 that this earth is in a state of decay. I mean, people are still passing away. The obituaries are full. Uh, no doubt all of us in here at some time or another have experienced the death of someone close to us. You know, the death of a loved one, a friend, family member. Uh, death is with us. But Jesus came to remove that curse. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans chapter 8. I'm going to start reading in in, in verse 18, Paul writes, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. In other words, something better is coming. The creation 
waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. Wow, think of that. The creation, the trees, the bushes, the flowers, the grass. It's all waiting for us to be resurrected. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, and hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Wow, think about that. The creation itself is, is groaning. Now, is this just merely figurative language? It probably, maybe. But who knows? There may be some frequency out there that these bushes and trees and grasses are, are emitting. That we just can't pick it up. They're frustrated. They want a utopia just like we do. They want to be in heaven like we want to be in heaven. Am I going too far with figurative language? Maybe. But he's saying that the whole creation is just in this state of frustration waiting on Jesus to come back and, and, and liberate all of us, including the creation. Verse 23, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. You know, we groan inwardly as well, do we not? Yes, we're adopted. It's an already but not yet kind of thing. Yes, we're saved, but ultimately we haven't been saved yet because he hasn't come back. But we're saved. It's an already not yet kind of thing. But we as Christians have a lot to look forward to if we've gotten ourselves out of Adam and gotten ourselves into Jesus. Because if we're into Jesus, who is the first fruits of the resurrection, we're going to be part of this greater resurrection. We're out of Adam and into Jesus. You see, Jesus set the undoing of this curse in motion when he died on the cross, paid the penalty for the sins of mankind, and then he validated, he proved that he did it by rising from the dead. That's why if there's no resurrection, we're still in our sins. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 15 as well. If there's no resurrection, we're without hope. We're just, we're hopeless. Beware of those who preach that there's no resurrection. And there are those who teach that. Islam teaches that. They don't believe Jesus died on the cross. They believe an imposter died in his place. Therefore, he didn't rise from the dead. So when people come to you and say, oh, yeah, they, they believe in Jesus. Like they're real smart. Oh, yeah, they believe in Jesus. They don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in his death on the cross. Where do you think that message comes from? I guarantee it's not the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus died on the cross. And he rose from the grave and proved he was who he said he was. And he did what he said he was going to do. Verse 22 of our text this morning. And Adam all die. So in Christ all will be made alive. Paul tells us in verses 51 and 52 that I shared with you earlier. That we're going to be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. I don't know how fast that is. I'm going to call it a nanosecond. A twinkling of an eye. That's quick, isn't it? He's going to come back in the clouds. The Bible says the holy angels are going to be with him and the dead in Christ are going to rise first. That harvest is going to come when Jesus returns. We're going to be made alive with a glorified body. This brings us to the third and final comparison. That's the Jesus slash victory comparison. Notice in verse 57, speaking of our own resurrection, Paul tells us that God is going to give us victory over death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus conquered death when he arose from the dead, and it's through his victory that we have victory. Maybe some of you remember The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson's movie, and, and there's a scene in that movie that kind of made me jump back in my seat when I saw it. In fact, there are several scenes in that movie that made me jump back. But I remember this one. Jesus is in the garden. He's praying, and all of a sudden, his foot comes down and stomps a snake's head. Do you remember that? This old snake up under Jesus' foot sh smashes it. Now, I don't profess to know everything that was in the mind of Mel Gibson when he put that scene in there. But I think I know where he gets the idea from. 
Let's take a look at Genesis chapter 3. This is referred to as the Proto-Evangelium, that's Latin, for the first gospel uh, message, the first gospel promise. This is when, uh, when God's uh, meeting out the consequences of, of Eve's sin, and he's, he's, he's talking to, to Eve. Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. So the Lord said to the serpent, who's really the devil, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Either the snake stood up on his back or he had legs. I don't know, but from here on he's going to crawl in the dirt. He's going to be a dirt eater. Verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. We understand that, don't we? I know there's a few of y'all out there probably like snakes, but most of us don't like snakes. They creep us out. We don't like them. We're not going to get down and try to look at their eye and see if it's slanted around and all that stuff. We want to get out of there. There's enmity between us and the snake. There's enmity between us and the devil. Okay? Notice the last part of verse 15. He, he's talking, talking to Eve, one of her offspring, he, singular, I want y'all to notice that, He will crush your head. So Eve is going to have an offspring, one of her offspring, centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries later, is going to crush the devil's head. And he will strike his heel. So this this child, this offspring of Eve, which is Jesus, Jesus came and the snake, which is the devil, struck Jesus' heel. He injured Jesus. He hurt Jesus on the cross. But by his death on the cross, Jesus crushed his head. The old devil got his head crushed at the cross. His days are numbered. He's not going to be messing with everybody forever. His time is at hand. But I want you to be aware of that. All the way back in the book of Genesis, God promises a redeemer. That's the theme of Scripture. The earth fell under a curse. Everything, plants, animals, the whole place is under a curse. And God's saying, I'm going to send you a redeemer, but, but he's, he's going to injure this promised child. He will injure him, but ultimately he is going to crush the old devil's head. So let's get back to our text. What's Paul saying here? He's saying in 1 Corinthians 15, 55. Let's get back to 1 Corinthians. We can't leave this out. Paul is saying here that death is going to be destroyed once and for all. And he mentions this, this, this victory taunt. He taunts death. What happens in a college football game if someone's taunting get in trouble don't they why because that taunting could stir somebody up next thing you know you got a fight on your hands and it's it's a mess so they try to keep that down don't get in somebody's face don't trash talk don't take a leap into the end zone all that kind of stuff that's taunt. well paul taunts death right here he taunts it listen listen to what the hebrew writer says to us he says since the children have flesh and blood He too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Well, how does the devil hold the power of death? He holds the power of death through sin. As long as he can induce people to sin... And keep them under the death penalty, away from Jesus, keep them in Adam, keep them in a sinful state. He's got them on death row. And people in that condition have a lot to fear. But in Jesus, he became one of us, lived a sinless life, died on the cross. And in him, now we can have eternal life and we should no longer fear death. Because the devil's had his head crushed. And we have the promise of the resurrection to spend all eternity with God. 
Heaven is going to come down. There's going to be heaven on earth, literally. And if you're a Christian, you get to be a part of it if you're a Christ follower. So Paul is so sure of this. Again, he taunts death. He gets in death's face. He gets smart with death. Let's look at that verse again. Y'all feel like smart Alex this morning just a little bit? Did y'all get smart just a little bit? Yes, come on, I know you can. Whew. Hope that wasn't some kind of weird sign. <laughs> it might have been, who knows? But we don't have to fear, do we? We don't have to even fear death. Let's, let's, let's see if we can make this victory taunt together. And I want you to put a little uh, sarcasm in there. Because if you're going to taunt, there has to be some sarcasm, right? Okay, let's, let's get a little smart. On the count of three, we're going to say this, this victory taunt. One, two, three. Where, oh death, is your victory? Where, oh death, is your sting? <laughs> Where, oh death, is your victory? Where, oh death, is your sting? Say it again. Where, oh death, is your sting? Yeah, that's good. That's what Paul is saying in our text. He is so sure of eternal life. He is so sure of the resurrection and our victory over death that he actually taunts death. That is a victory taunt. I'll close with this. It's, a, it's an illustration out of Frank Peretti's book, This Present Darkness. And it's about a family who's on vacation and they're, they're, they're traveling down the highway. Very warm day, nice breeze. And they decide that they would roll down the window and get some fresh air. So they're traveling down the road, windows down, and all of a sudden, this big black bumblebee flies into the car. And that bumblebee starts making figure eights inside the car. And there's a little girl in the back seat, and she begins to cry out, Daddy, Daddy, the bee's going to sting me. Oh, Daddy, the bee's going to sting me. Ah, she's just going to pieces because she's allergic to bees. And if she gets stung, she could die within the hour. So it's, Daddy, Daddy, there's a bee. So, so he's, he's trying to catch the bee and trying to get the car off the road. And finally, he pins it against the glass and catches it in his hands, and he has the bee in his fist. And finally, it happens. The bee stings him. And then he lets it go. The little girl in the back seat begins to cry again. Daddy, 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 oh, the bee's going to sting me. It's going to sting me. And the father replies, no, honey, he's not going to sting now. Look what I have in my hand. And the father opened up his hand and showed her that he had taken the sting. At the cross, Jesus took the sting of death for us and validated it with his resurrection. Now all Satan can do is buzz.